Hello and welcome back to my blog. We're wrapping up part 29 of the creative process in the individual by T. Troward, chapter 11, Ourselves in the Divine Offering, part 6. But if we realize these things, we have already laid hold of the principle of resurrection, and in point of principle, we are already living the resurrection life. What progress we may make in it depends on our practical application of the principle, but simply as principle, there is nothing in the principle itself to prevent its complete working at any moment. This is why Jesus did not refer resurrection to some remote point of time, but said, I am the resurrection and the life. No principle can carry in itself an opposite and limiting principle contradictory of its own nature, and this is as true of the principle of life as of any other principle. It is we who, by our thought, introduce an opposite and limiting principle, and so hinder the working of the principle we are seeking to bring into operation. But so far as the principle of life itself is concerned, there is, in it, no reason why it should not come into perfect manifestation here and now. This, then, is the true purpose of worship. It is to bring us into conscious and loving intercourse with the supreme source of our own being, and seeing this, we shall not neglect the outward forms of worship. From what we now know, they should mean more to us than to others, and not less. And in especial, if we realize the manifestation of the divine personality in Jesus Christ and its reproduction in man, we shall not neglect his last command to partake of that sacred memorial to his flesh and blood, which he bequeathed to his followers with the words, This do in remembrance of me. <clears throat> this holy rite is no superstitious human invention. There are many theories about it, and I do not wish to combat any of them, for in the end they all seem to me to bring us to the same point, that being cleansed from sin by the divine love, we are now no longer separate from God, but become partakers of the divine nature. Second Peter chapter 1, um, 4. This partaking of the divine nature could not be more accurately represented than by our partaking of bread and wine as symbols of the divine substance and the divine life, thus made emblematic of the whole creative process from its beginning in the divine thought to its completion in the manifestation of that thought as perfected man. And so it brings vividly before us the remembrance of the personality of God taking form as the Son of Man. We are all familiar with the saying that thoughts become things. And if we affirm the creative power of our own thought as reproducing itself in outward form, how much more must we affirm the same of that divine thought which brings the whole universe into existence? So that in, the accor in accordance with our own principles, the divine idea of man was logically bound to show itself in the world of time and space as the Son of God and the Son of Man, not two differing natures, but one complete whole, thus summing up the foundation principle of all creation in one undivided consciousness of personality. Thus, the Word, or divine thought of man, became flesh, and our partaking of the symbolic elements keeps in our remembrance the supreme truth that this same Word, or thought of God in like manner, takes form in ourselves as we open our own thought to receive it. And further, if we realize that throughout the universe there is only one originating life, sending forth only one original substance as the vehicle for its expression, then it logically follows that, in essence, the bread is a portion of the eternal substance of God and the wine a portion of the eternal life of God. For though the wine is, of course, also a part of the universal substance, we must remember that the universal substance is itself a manifestation of the life of the all-creating spirit. And therefore, this fluid form of the primary substance has been selected as representing the eternal flowing of the life of the Spirit into all creation, culminating in its supreme expression in the consciousness of those who, in the recognition of these truths, seek to bring their heart into union with the Divine Spirit. From such considerations as these, it will be seen how vast a field of thought is covered by Christ's words, Do this in remembrance of me. In conclusion, therefore, do not let yourselves be led astray by any philosophy that denies the personality of God. In the end, it will be found to be a foolish philosophy. No other starting point of creation is conceivable than the self-contemplation of the Divine Spirit, and the logical sequence from this brings us to the ultimate result of the creative process in the statement that, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, or as the margin has it, a new creation. 2 Corinthians verse 17. Such vain philosophies have only one logical result, which is to put yourself 
in the place of God, and then what have you to lean upon in the hour of trial? It is like trying to climb up a ladder that is resting against nothing. Therefore, says the Apostle Paul, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the, the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The teaching of the Bible is sound philosophy, sound reasoning, and sound science, because it starts with the sound premises that all creation proceeds out of God, and that man is made in the image and likeness of his creator. It nowhere departs from the law of cause and effect. And by the orderly sequence of this law, it brings us at last to the new creation, both in ourselves and in our environment, so that we find the completion of the creative process in the declaration, the tabernacle, tabernacle of God is with men. And in the promise, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, i.e. the days of our imperfect apprehension of these things. Saith the Lord, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Truly, does Bacon say, quote, a little philosophy inclineth a man's mind to atheism, but depth in philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion. End quote. Bacon, essay 16. And that is the end of the creative process in the individual by T. Troward. Something else tomorrow? What will it be? I'm going to tune in myself and find out. Make it a great day, and bye for now.